All right, if you would, turn with me to Exodus, and we are going to look at chapters 33 and 34 this morning. And uh, just to kind of catch us up, you know, the, the descendants of Israel or the Hebrews, they were enslaved to the Egyptians for 400 years, right? They finally cry out to God. God gives Moses the task of leading the people out of Egypt back to the land that God had promised to Abraham so many years ago. God uses a series of ten plagues, you remember, to convince the Pharaoh to release the descendants of Israel, the Hebrews, which the Pharaoh finally does. And then he changes his mind. He goes after the Hebrews. God parts the Red Sea, miraculously saving his people. And then God allows the sea to collapse on top of the pursuing Egyptian army. And God is performing these other miracles along the way here. Remember, he changed the bitter water uh, that they had come across to drinkable water. God had provided this manna, this bread from heaven for them to eat. The people got tired of the manna, started complaining, and so God provided meat for them. He brought all the quail they could eat. Uh, God miraculously provided water from the rock. You remember just a few weeks ago, Scott Dingfelder uh, was here and, and taught us specifically about that miracle. Uh, God has been with the people appearing as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And uh, God brings them to the base of Mount Sinai. And so God's been a real part of this exodus, these people. Moses, he's up on the mountain with God. Remember, God calls him up there. And God's been giving Moses uh, instructions on just about everything pertaining to life. God's given him the moral law, the Ten Commandments, which is the overall foundation for living a godly moral life. God has relayed the civil law, the rules that govern the day-to-day living in society with other people. Uh, God has given them the ceremonial law, the rules that pertain to the honor and worship of God. God has given instruction on how to build this tabernacle, the, the portable temple that could be set up and taken down and carried along with them as they moved from one location to another. Uh, during the leading, uh, as God led them through this desert. Uh, God has given them instructions on the furniture, the implements. God gave them instruction about the priests, the ones that would be working uh, and serving in the tabernacle, as as well as the ones responsible for the upkeep. what the, re- what the priests were supposed to wear in their service to him. God has given them instruction on how the priests were to be consecrated or set apart for service to God. God has given instruction about the sacrifices that were be- to be made to him in the tabernacle by the priests. And we're told when God finished speaking with Moses on top of the mountain, uh, God gave Moses these tablets of stone, two tablets containing this testimony, this covenant. And it was written by the finger of God. And then God tells Moses to go down the mountain back to the people because they had basically lost their minds. Remember, while Moses is on top of the mountain receiving all this instruction from God, the same God that had been with them, with the people, as a pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, and that had performed all of these miracles, supplying food, supplying water miraculously, well, because Moses had been gone for a few weeks on a mountaintop, the people decided hey, they needed a new God. And so they decided to have Aaron make one out of melted down jewelry. And Aaron forms this gold statue of a baby cow. And then the people say that this chunk of metal uh, that is in the shape of a baby cow is in fact the God that had delivered them from Egypt. And they have this huge party and they're eating and drinking and playing, the Bible says, and they offer sacrifices to this stupid chunk of metal. It's ridiculous. And God tells Moses to step aside so God can destroy them because he's so angry with them, and rightfully so. God tells Moses that he'll just start over. He'll make a great nation through Moses and his descendants, and they'll still be descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God will still fulfill his promise. Uh, God says, hey, we'll just do plan B here. And uh, Moses just blows me away here. He intercedes. It, Instead of stepping to the side and leaving God alone as God had requested, God told him, step aside, leave me alone. Moses basically steps in between God and the people and asks God not to destroy these people. And God changes the plan. He says, okay, Moses, we won't do plan B. We We won't be starting over with you and your descendants. We'll stick with plan A. And this is, it's just amazing. God told Moses leave to leave him alone. 
He says, leave me alone so that my anger can burn against these people, that I can destroy them. And Moses did not leave God alone, but he pleaded on behalf of the people. Moses loved these people. And because of that, for the sake of Moses, God decided to stick with plan A. And Moses comes down the mountain, he sees the people for himself, and then he burns with anger, so much so that he throws the tablets that God had written with his own finger, he throws them on the ground, shatters them, and then Moses disposes of the the chunk of metal that they were calling God, and he tells the people, if they are for the Lord, if they are for Yahweh, uh, they need to meet him at the gate of the camp, and then God eliminated all the men that did not choose to come back to God. And that brings us to chapter 33. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, because you are an obstinate people, and I might destroy you on the way. So God tells them, pack up and move on. It's time to go to the promised land. God says he'll send an angel before them to wipe out their enemies, to protect them. And then God says something that was very disturbing to the people. God says that he cannot go with them because they're so obstinate that he might kill them on the way. This is, this is very sad. I mean, could you imagine? Uh, God spares these people on behalf of Moses, but God says, I can't be around them because they're so obstinate, so pig-headed, implying that they would probably do something stupid again, and God says, I might destroy them this time before we even get there. Verse 4, when the people heard this sad word, they went into mourning, and none of them put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the sons of Israel, you are an obstinate people. Should I go up in your midst for one moment, I would destroy you. Now therefore, put off your ornaments from you, that I may know what I shall do with you. So the sons of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. So the people mourned over what God had said. When God's God, who is full of grace, full of mercy, and he says, if I'm around you for one moment, I would destroy you. That has to be a very hard thing to hear. And so the people went into mourning. And uh, they did not put on their ornaments, as most, most likely this is different types of jewelry, rings, necklaces, bracelets. So if God cannot come along with them, how uh, is Moses going to remain in communication with God, you know, in order to stay on track, in order to follow his leading? Well, we're told in verse 7, Now Moses used to take a t- the tent and pitch it outside the camp a good distance from from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And it came about whenever Moses went out to the tent that all the people would arise and stand, each at the entrance of his tent, and gaze after Moses until he entered the tent. Verse 9 Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship, each at the entrance of his tent. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. So Joshua kind of stood guard over this tent of meeting. So although God had given the instructions to Moses on how to build the tabernacle, they they hadn't had a chance to build it yet. And so instead, Moses, he would set up this tent as a place to meet with God. And he would set it up outside the camp, a good distance away, we're told. And this is interesting because when the tabernacle's made, the people uh, will camp around it. The, The tabernacle's kind of the centerpiece of the camp. But because of the people's sin and this separation of sin, uh, The place where Moses could meet with God was outside the camp, a good distance from the camp, we're told. 
And notice that people have a little different attitude compared to when Moses met with God on top of the mountain. Now they watch Moses as he walks out of the camp all the way to this tent of meeting. And then when Moses enters the tent to meet with God and he's out of their sight, instead of doing something stupid like worshiping a chunk of metal, we're told that all the people would arise and worship God at the entrances of their own tents. And so they're, they're learning. Verse 12, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have found, also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways, that I may know you, so that I my, my, may find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Moses says to God, he says, you told me to bring these people to the promised land, uh, but you haven't told me who you're going to send with me. Moses is saying, I, I can't do this alone, God. I need some help. And by the way, uh, you've said that you know me by name, like I'm your guy. Well, I'd like to get to know you better, Moses says to God, so that I might find favor in your sight. So do you hear what Moses is saying here? He's saying to God, because you decided that you cannot accompany, accompany, accompany us, there's a major void here. There's a job opening. He says, I need some serious help. So he reminds, reminds God that God knows Moses very well. And Moses says that he would like to know God very well. He's saying, God, we have this jo job opening that fits your description perfectly. And if, let's say, you were to fill that opening and, and come along with us, someone like me would get the opportunity to get to know you better, which would help me be a better servant to you. And he says, oh, and one other thing, by the way, you know that this nation is your people. Moses tells God that these are your people. And it's very interesting. Remember when the people were worshiping the chunk of metal? And back in 32, God told Moses in 32 verse 7, then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people, whom you brought up from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. And I love this. How many of us parents have said this type of statement before? Do you know what your son did today? Or do you know what your daughter did today? Well, it must have been something bad, because yesterday he was our son, or yesterday she was our daughter, right? God says, Moses, get down there. Your people that you brought up from Egypt have corrupted themselves. And now Moses is telling God, by the way, these are your people. Don't try to pin them on me. You know, and, I, and I see uh, a little humor in this. Maybe a little playful banter between God and Moses. They both know who, whose people these are, right? They both know who's in charge. But it's like they have this camaraderie, this friendship, uh, and it's really cool. And you know, I, I want to say that I'm envious of Moses, and I am here, but I don't think God had any different feelings towards Moses than he did anybody else. But Moses most certainly had different feelings for God than most people did. In, in other words, God is not the limiting factor in our relationship with him. So Moses is basically saying, I need your help, Lord. We need your help. We need you with us, Lord. In verse 14, and he said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. And this is amazing. This blows me away. As angry as God was with these people, as he should have been, but because of Moses, God spares the people. Uh, but then he said he couldn't accompany them because they would push him over the edge. And now Moses pleads with God once again, asking God to accompany them. And God says to Moses, okay. My presence will go with you. I will give you rest. Moses, it's okay. I'll go with you. But apparently, Moses didn't hear it. Maybe he didn't want to hear it. Maybe he had, he had played out this whole conversation in his mind, and God agreed sooner than he anticipated. Moses had presented this first round of arguments for God joining them or coming back to the people. Moses says he can't do, number one, he says he can't do this alone. 
Uh, and he points out that God had not yet filled this position that was left open when God said he could no longer accompany them. Number two, Moses points out that he'd like to get to know God better, implying that he'd like to spend more time with God. And number three, Moses points out, after all, these are your people, God. And God says, okay, Moses, my presence will join you. Relax, take a breath of relief. Then verse 15, then he said to him, then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon, who are upon the face of the earth? God's probably thinking, hello, did I not just say that my presence will join them? Dude, you proved your point a paragraph ago. Can, you know, can we move on? Okay, God's maybe thinking, talk about obstinate. You know, Moses, are you sure these aren't your people? You're acting just like them. Verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. God says, okay, Moses, I will do it. My presence will join you because you have found favor in my sight. And I have known you by name because you're my friend, basically, God is saying. Then Moses is like, oh, well, since we're friends and all, verse 18, then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. So Moses has already stated that he wants to know the Lord better, and part of that is wanting to see the Lord, to see what he looks like. Verse 19, and he said, God said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Verse 21, then the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about, while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Moses desires to see God in all his glory, but the Lord says, If I were to show... Uh, you, Moses, if, I show, if God were to show Moses all his glory, it would kill him. And doesn't that just make you want to see God all the more? I mean, not because it would kill you, but because his spiritual glory is so impressive, so powerful, or so something, that it would shut down our physical bodies just to see it. Uh, that's just got to be so awesome, so incredible, so magnificent. So God explains to Moses that he will allow him to see his aftermath or his afterglow. God will pass his glory by while keeping Moses shielded, and then God will let him see the, the after effects. Chapter 34, verse 1, Now the Lord said to Moses, Cut out for yourself two, two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. So be ready by morning. And come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of that mountain. So apparently even the animals cannot handle seeing the glory of God. Verse 4, so he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones. And Moses rose up early in the morning, and he went up to Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him. And he took two stone tablets in his hand. And the Lord descended in a cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, remember this is Lord in all caps, it's Yahweh, it's Y-H-W-H, we think it's Yahweh or Jehovah or Yehovah. It says the Lord or Yahweh Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. God is defining his own name. Yahweh God. 
He is defining himself. And he defines himself as compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet, however, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And this seems like a contradiction. How can someone be forgiven but still remain guilty and receive punishment? We're told in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, we read, Because Christ also once for all died for sins, the innocent one, Christ, for the guilty many, in order to bring us to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Justice will be served. Either we will suffer the punishment of our own guilt, or we will accept God's gracious, compassionate, abounding in loving kindness offer, allowing himself to suffer the punishment on our behalf through Jesus Christ, God in human form. So it will not go unpunished. It will be either us or it will be him. It's one or the other. So God defines his name for us. And just his name alone is incredibly impressive. It's almost un, un, or incomprehensible. And how does Moses respond to seeing the aftermath of God and, and, and hearing God define what his name means? We, we read in Exodus 34, verse 8, Moses made haste to bow low towards the earth and worship. So even though Moses and God had this friendship-type relationship, as God revealed more of himself to Moses, Moses responded by immediately bowing to the ground and worshiping God. And then Moses once again intercedes to the Lord on behalf of the people. Verse 9, he said, Now, if I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst even though the people are so obstinate and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your own possession. Even though God had already stated twice that his presence will go along with the people, Moses asks him a third time, and this time Moses asks God to join them even though the people are so obstinate. Moses is not asking God to join them if the people can stop being so obstinate. Moses asks God to join them even though the people are so obstinate. And then he asks God to pardon their iniquity and their sin, and he asks God to take the people as his own possession. Verse 10, Then God said, Behold, I'm going to make a covenant. Before all your people I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth, nor among any of the nations. And thinking back of the ten plagues, they've seen some pretty impressive miracles already. And all the people among whom you live will see the working of the Lord, for it is a fearful thing that I am going to perform with you. Verse 11, Be sure to observe what I am commanding you this day. Behold, I am going to drive out the Amorite before you, and the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going, or it will become a snare in your midst. Verse 13, but rather you are to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their asherim. For you shall not worship any other god. For the Lord, or Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Otherwise, you might make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they would play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods. And someone might invite you to eat of his sacrifice. Verse 16, And you might take some of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters might play the harlot with their gods and cause your sons also to play the harlot with their gods. You shall make for yourself no molten gods. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the appointed time in the month of Abib. For the month of Abib you came out of Egypt. 
So God is going over the covenant again. He agreed to rejoin the people, and he's giving them some precautions to help them from falling back into the sin that, had just, that they had just asked forgiveness from. The sin of idolatry, the sin of worshiping something in place of God, which God compares to prostituting themselves. And God knows that the people groups that are currently living on the property that God has deeded to the Hebrews, God knows that they're worshiping different idols and different false gods. And God knows if the Hebrews intermarry with them, uh, that some will be drawn back into idol worship. God knows if they leave any trace of these false gods or their altars, that the Hebrews will be tempted to jump right back into it. So God very clearly states that all of that stuff needs to be destroyed. God says he's going to drive all the people out and that the Hebrews are not to make any kind of agreements with them. And again, he states that they shall not make molten gods. Just in case there was any misunderstanding about the whole golden calf ordeal. God again commands them to celebrate the Passover feast so they remember that God delivered them from slavery. So they won't allow themselves to be enslaved again, especially spiritually enslaved to this sin of idolatry. Verse 19, the first offspring from every womb belongs to me. And all your male livestock, the first offspring from the cattle and sheep, you shall redeem with a lamb the first offspring from a donkey. And if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. You shall redeem all the firstborn of your sons. None shall appear before me empty-handed. God reminds them again to dedicate the firstborn to him also in remembrance of the Passover. Remember how the, the firstborn of the Hebrews was spared only if the lamb was sacrificed in their place and they indicated this was done by painting the blood on the doorpost and on the header of their house. Verse 21, you shall work for six days, God says, but on the seventh day you shall rest, even during plowing time. And harvest, you shall rest. You shall celebrate the weeks of the feast of weeks, that is the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year, all your males are to appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. Verse 24, for I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your borders, and no man shall cover, covet your land when you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor is the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover to be left until morning. You shall bring the very first of the first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And so God's going back over this covenant with Moses while Moses is again on the mountain. God has allowed Moses to see, remember, the afterglow of his glory. God reminds Moses of these three mandatory feasts that required all the Hebrews to come before the Lord. And then God commands them not to boil a young goat in its mother's milk, which seems like a strange thing to say. And it's believed that this was done by some of the people groups uh, in this land that the Lord was going to remove from the land. And it's speculated that this was some sort of fertility rite. And this one command is why the Orthodox Jews today will not eat meat and dairy products together. And it's pretty strange. It's because there might be a one in one billionth chance that the meat you're eating was the offspring of the cow or goat that produced the milk. And uh, those together in the action of your stomach acid could possibly be construed as boiling this meat in the mother's milk. And this is just an extreme example of legalism uh, to the point where they will not eat a pork sausage pizza, even though the sausage came from a pig and the cheese came from a cow's milk. But hey, better safe than sorry is their kind of thought behind it. In the context that God gives this verse, it's clearly not about eating. It's about falling into idolatry again, right? That's what he's talking about. That's what he's warning them about. And as stupid as it sounds, remember, they just got done worshiping and offering sacrifices to a chunk of metal. So you've got to get in that mind frame. It's shaped like a baby cow. They're 
offering, saying it's God. So you can imagine if a woman was having trouble getting pregnant and a Canaanite told her of this fertility ritual, that, hey, we do this, uh, you know, uh, as ridiculous as it sounds, it's still not as ridiculous as making sacrifices to a chunk of metal. And so God says, hey, don't do this. You know, if you're having trouble getting pregnant, talk to me, is all he's saying. Verse 27, then the Lord says to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat bread or drink water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And it came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. Remember last time that Moses came down the mountain with the two tablets, his face was probably red with anger as he threw the tablets down, shattering them. This time his face is glowing from being in the presence of God. Verse 30, so when Aaron and the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the sons of Israel came near, and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. Verse 33, when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out to speak to the sons of Israel, what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, so Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. God, remember, God was about to wipe out the Hebrew people off the face of the earth and start over with Moses. Moses loved the people so much that he interceded to God on their behalf. He prays, he, he pleads with God. He asked God to spare their lives. And God did. Moses asked God to rejoin the people, take the people back. God did. Moses expresses his, his desire to get to know God better and to see his glory. God did that as well. God made that happen. Moses spent another 40 days on the mountain with God and his face radiated God's glory. What does that tell you and me? about prayer what does that tell you about making your requests known to god let's pray lord we thank you for who you are we thank you for moses your servant and this incredible example we thank you for hearing moses as he pleads with you as he prays on behalf of the people and Lord, I just ask that you would help us to be like Moses, to be like your servant, Lord, uh, to lift up one another in prayer, to plead with you on their behalf, Lord, those that are ill, those that are sick, those that uh, have sinned and have stumbled. And uh, Lord, I just ask that you would give us, help us to have a heart like Moses had, a heart like yours, Lord. Lord, help us to understand how prayer works, Lord, how you listen and you changed what you were going to do just because Moses asked you to, just because your love for him. And so, Lord, I just ask you to help us to realize that, help us to understand this incredible opportunity that you have given us uh, to, to speak with you and plead with you and get to know you better. Lord, help us to, to have a desire like Moses to, to get to know you better, Lord, to see your glory. What a great desire to have, Lord. Give us that desire right now. Lord, be with us this week, this holiday. Help us to 
to glow you, to magnify you, to allow you, your glory, to shine through us to friends and family, all that we encounter this week. In Jesus' name we pray.